The afternoon session will now begin with a musical prelude. Thus, we invite you to be seated and enjoy the musical program.
души всех имен, Творца Его имя. Его власть несравнима, Его ты наш Бог. Ты оказал нам честь и всех племен и наций в один народ собраться, чтоб имя чтить твое. All are invited to stand and sing together song number 111 entitled Our Reasons for Joy. That's song number 111.
Please be seated. We benefit from hearing the experiences of those who are joyfully serving Jehovah. Now we will hear from some who are having good success in applying recent direction on how to carry out our ministry. Let's listen as Brother Adam Stovall conducts these interviews. We as Jehovah's Witnesses are known for and treasure our preaching and teaching work. But how can we personally increase our joy in the ministry? By applying what we learn at the midweek meeting. This includes following the suggestions in our midweek meeting workbook and also effectively using the teaching toolbox that we have available. As we do, we as ministers sharpen our skills in both finding and teaching those that Acts 1348 records as rightly disposed for everlasting life. As we do so, this increases our joy in the ministry. We'll now enjoy three experiences from publishers illustrating the value of our midweek meeting and how applying the suggestions we learn each week can contribute to joy. We'll first start with Sister Gina Brooks. Uh, Sister Brooks, please tell us, how did you start the initial conversation? Well, it was during the holiday season, and I realized many were busy shopping for gifts for their loved ones. So I thought I would try to use that as a conversation starter. When I found a young man at home, I asked him, do you think it's possible to find the perfect gift for our loved ones, one that they'll never tire of or need replacing? He thought about it, and he said, I guess, but you would really have to know the person you're buying the gift for. I agreed with him, and then I asked if he would like to know who the Bible identifies as the perfect gift giver. He said yes, and I was able to read James 1.17, where it says, Every good gift and every perfect present is from above, coming down from the Father of the celestial lights. Then I left him with the question, Since our Heavenly Father provides perfect gifts for us, do you think he requires anything from us in return? That was an excellent use of a relevant topic during the holiday season. But now let's, we'll ask you, uh, how were you able to introduce literature from our teaching toolbox? Well, when my husband and I returned, we told the young man that we had brought him a gift. It was the Good News from God brochure. We highlighted how this brochure had helped us get to know the many gifts God has provided, but more importantly, what we need to do to benefit from them. And then we turned to the back of the brochure, showed him the questions, and asked him to pick one he would like to know more about. And he chose, how can you recognize true worship? Very fine. So you introduced the Good News brochure. Now may I ask, how have you and your husband been able to cultivate the interest you found? Well, one way was by quickly handing over the call to my husband. This allowed him to start a regular Bible study with the young man, bring other brothers on the visit with him, and also keep in contact in between visits with encouraging text messages. Another way we tried to cultivate the interest was by highlighting the JW.org website. We tried to highlight it every visit we were there, sharing encouraging things that we've enjoyed from it. And we realized by doing this, he could go on the website figure out how to use the tool, and be better able to fill his own spiritual hunger in between our visits. And just an example of that, we were reading a scripture with God's name Jehovah in it one day, and he said, isn't that the name that's been removed from the Bible thousands of times? We were a little shocked because we hadn't yet gone over that topic with him. But he said, well, I looked on your website and found a video on that subject and found it really interesting. So it brought us such joy and it warmed our heart to see him filling his own spiritual need through the tools we have. Thank you very much, Sister Brooks. We appreciate that encouraging experience. Uh, and we're also sure your husband greatly enjoyed inheriting that Bible study. Our next interview will be with Brother Michael Clark. And Brother Clark, same question for you. How were you able to get a conversation started using the telephone? Yeah, so my wife and I were telephone witnessing in early June, and I was able to talk to a man, and probably like many have been, I started the conversation talking about the pandemic and the nationwide protests that were underway at the time. And he was willing to talk, and uh, he was active in the conversation, which was great. We were able to get into the Bible. We read several scriptures about the peace and the good health that God's government, God's kingdom will bring in the future. Very good. So good use, again, of starting a conversation with relevant news topics. Uh, so question for you, how were you able to introduce tools from our teaching toolbox? 
So he doesn't have a cell phone, so I couldn't send him a link to the website, but I directed him to the Good News brochure and specifically to Lesson 5 about what God's purpose for the earth is. And right there on the initial call, we were able to discuss part of that lesson. And it was so fun to be able to have a spiritual conversation with somebody, and, and it brought me a lot of joy. Definitely, we can tell. Now, because you discerned this interest and you were able to introduce the Good News brochure, Lesson 5, right away, uh, excellent example for us using the toolbox. But now please tell us, what have you done to be able to cultivate the interest you found? Well, I've tried to follow the suggestions from the midweek meeting about uh, what you're going to talk about the next time, maybe leaving a question or just telling them what the discussion will be next time. And also, I've tried to be consistent. Um, so from that initial call, I've, I've called him every week. Now, not every time does he answer. And partially, he lives in a very rural area, and so his phone service isn't very reliable. In fact, the last time I talked to him, he told me, now, if we get cut off or I don't pick up, don't get your feelings hurt. Just call me back. So it, it helps me stay positive. I don't get discouraged when he doesn't answer. I just leave him an, an encouraging message, and I try again next time. And I do feel positive that in time, he will respond to the good news. Thank you very much, Brother Clark. We appreciate that encouraging experience as well as your positive outlook on that call. Our third experience will be from Sister Nina Money. Now, Sister Money, to ask you this question, could you please share with us how were you able to start a conversation? Well, I was also doing phone witnessing. I called to speak to a Hindi-speaking family on the territory, and an older woman picked up the phone who is hard of hearing. So she ended up handing the phone over to her nurse. Now, her nurse is Urdu-speaking and works seven days a week, so she herself is never at home. I was able to start a conversation with her about how she was doing with the conditions during the pandemic and to see what she thought about the world situation. She uh, mentioned that her brother had recently passed away to an illness, but during the conversation, I was able to find out that she's an avid Bible reader. And so she was so happy to hear me read Isaiah 41.10. And I really enjoyed the conversation that we had, which lasted over a half hour. Excellent. So I know you enjoyed that conversation with the nurse. Now, when were you able to feature publications from our teaching toolbox? Well, while we were still on the phone, I was able to exchange contact information with the woman since she didn't live at the house that I had originally called. I used the initial call presentation from the meeting workbook about the last days, which featured 2 Timothy 3, and I was also able to send her the JW.org website in Urdu. I called two days later, and we spoke about the hope for the future and presented the Teach Us book, which I sent to her as a link. Excellent. So what a good example of utilizing our midweek meeting, meeting training on introducing the sample conversation sharing the website, as well as a Teach Us book link. Very good. Now, how have you been able to cultivate this interest further? Well, on the first call, the woman was so enthusiastic that she said the householder also needed to hear about this information. So she handed the phone back. The older woman still couldn't really hear me, and she ended up to speak a different language. So I was able to contact a sister who called her that very day and spoke to her in her language. And she is now an active return visit. The next time I called on the Urdu-speaking woman, she didn't have a lot of time to talk. But despite that, we were able to go over to two pages of the Teach Us book and read several scriptures together. Though she is hard to reach, she really enjoyed hearing the promises from the Bible and eagerly expressed that the solution to mankind's problems lies with God and not man. So I keep trying. And I look forward to further conversations with her and hope that she responds to the good news. Thank you very much, Sister Money, Sister Brooks, Brother Clark. We appreciated all of those encouraging interviews. As we think about the work that we have to complete, we certainly appreciate the training that we're receiving at our midweek meeting. As we apply the suggestions from our Life and Ministry Meeting Workbook, we effectively utilize our publications from our teaching toolbox our joy is increased. And our joy is heightened even more as we continue to search for, find, and teach those rightly disposed for everlasting life. Thank you, Brother Stovall, for those encouraging interviews. Jehovah is a God of wonderful works, and he invites us to work along with him. 
The following three-part symposium will alert us to opportunities to work along with Jehovah, and it will highlight the joy that results. Each speaker will introduce the one to follow. We now invite Brother Edward Duran to present the talk, Jehovah Makes Us Rejoice As We Make Disciples. Jehovah is a happy God, and he wants for you and I to also be happy. What does Jehovah do, though, to make us rejoice? Well, for one thing, he's given us many beautiful gifts that we can enjoy. But there's an important lesson that we will learn in this symposium as to how Jehovah makes us rejoice. In Psalm 104 and verse 31, we learn that Jehovah rejoices in his works. In other words, he feels great joy and satisfaction and the many marvelous things that he's accomplishing. But here's the lesson. He wants for you and I to also have a share in the joy that he feels. Notice with me, please, our theme scripture of Psalm 92, verses 4 and 5, and how it draws our attention to what could be our cause for rejoicing. That's Psalm 92, verses 4 and 5. For you have... Made me rejoice, O Jehovah, because of your deeds. Because of your works of your hands, I shout joyfully. How great your works are, O Jehovah. How very deep your thoughts are. Did you notice what could be our cause for rejoicing? Well, as the verse mentions, it's his deeds and it's his works. Now, admiring these things can bring us great joy but there's something else that you and I could do to increase our joy. As God's fellow workers, he invites us to work along with him in these deeds and works, and this brings great joy to us. Now, we're not aware of all the marvelous things that Jehovah's accomplishing at this moment, but we are aware of some of them. This symposium will teach us how Jehovah makes us rejoice in three different areas. First, as we make disciples. Second, as we support fellow believers. And three, as we endure trials. Each part will include interviews with those who have rejoiced in working along with Jehovah in his deeds and in his works. Now, for this part, as we make disciples, there's two main points that we'll talk about. First, how Jehovah works to make disciples. At John 6 and verse 44, we learn that a person cannot become a disciple unless Jehovah personally draws him. But once Jehovah finds a heart that is rightly disposed, he gently draws them or tugs at their heart. To illustrate, what might happen to you when you walk by a bakery? Does the aroma of the warm, fresh bread just dry you in? The pleasant aroma of the Bible's good news draws people to the truth. And when Jehovah sees that a heart is responsive, he uses his Holy Spirit to help that individual to understand the truth, but more importantly, to apply it in their life. But now, somehow Jehovah has to connect those that are rightly disposed with the truth of the good news. How does he do this? We could be reminded in Revelation chapter 14. This is all part of Jehovah's work in making disciples. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6. And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, and he had everlasting good news to declare to those who dwell on the earth. Now, what do we learn from this verse? that Jehovah uses his angels to help you and I to find the very ones he's drawing. Isn't that an awesome privilege that we have? So often we hear of witnesses calling on different ones who had just finished praying for help in finding the truth. These experiences happen far too often to be dismissed as mere coincidence. Uh, Just to illustrate with a brief experience, two adult witnesses were preaching with a very young child, and they had decided to finish their morning preaching work. 
However, for some reason, this young child was especially eager to go up and do another door. And that's exactly what he did. He knocked on the door by himself. When a young lady opened the door, the two adult witnesses rushed up to the door to speak to the woman. To their surprise, the woman had explained that she had just finished praying that someone would study the Bible with her. So what do you think? Mere coincidence? Or is this Jehovah at work making disciples? What's the point? Well, we can be confident that Jehovah will send us to the right person at the right time by means of his angels. So yes, this is how Jehovah works to make disciples. But now let's consider our second main point how we can work with Jehovah in making disciples. Here's four things that you and I could do. First, keep searching. Our preaching work is much like a search and rescue work. We search out those with the right heart condition. Even though some individuals do not want to be rescued, we just keep searching. Number two, Serve spiritual food that is appetizing to our listeners. Just as we would serve our guests uh, their favorite appetizer or a nice meal, we also want to serve the people in the territory information that is appetizing to them. We take time in the preparation of our ministry to think of subjects that would stimulate their interest and spiritually nourish them. We adapt to the needs of our territory. Number three, invest time and effort to follow up on initial interest. An investment can only grow if we make regular deposits. Return visits could be likened to an investment. Their spiritual appreciation and love for Jehovah and Jesus and the truth will only grow if we make regular deposits in their minds and in their hearts. Number four, Guide your Bible student. To illustrate, we might think of a driving instructor. The driving instructor first teaches his students the rules of the road in a classroom. But the practical part happens when he guides his student on the road. He actually gets in the car with them, drives in the traffic, and helps the student put into practice the things that they've learned in the classroom. Well, making a disciple involves many regular classroom sessions in the form of a Bible study. We progressively teach our Bible student about Jehovah, his purposes, his likes and dislikes, and about Bible principles. We help them to apply Bible principles in their everyday life. Yes, this is the practical part where we help them on the road of life. And even if they face opposition, we help them to defend Bible truths. We help them to become disciple makers. Yes, this is the hard work in making disciples with Jehovah. But you know, as that student makes changes in their life, we can rejoice in Jehovah. But now, let's illustrate the joy that you and I can feel with two real-life examples. We're going to interview a couple of sisters. We have with us first Sister Carla Winkler. Uh, Sister Winkler, you and your husband were conducting a Bible study with a woman by the name of Irene. Could you tell us about a key moment in the study that led to a change? Yes. Uh, We had invited Irene to attend the meetings with us, but she wouldn't come because she felt anxious around groups of people. So after several weeks of studying with her, we decided to show her the broadcast where Brother Sanderson invites inactive ones to return to Jehovah. We thought that might appeal to her because she had studied many years ago, and it did. She connected to the video right away, and she even responded out loud in certain parts. That's a great use of that video. Please tell us what happened next. As soon as the video ended, she said, yes, I'm ready to come. And she came to the meeting the very next day. At the meeting, a sister was visiting from Brazil who Irene recognized. So despite all her anxiety, she approached her to say hello. 
And the sisters stared at her hard, and then they were laughing and crying because it turned out it was Irene's very first Bible study conductor from Brazil in the 1980s who happened to be visiting our congregation. And after that, she came to every weekend meeting from then on. That's beautiful. And we know that Irene is now our baptized sister and doing so well. Sister Winkler, could you tell us how you feel about working along with Jehovah in making disciples? Yes, it it's been so amazing to see how Jehovah's drawing of people to him is very personal between him and each individual he draws, and sensing the participation of the angels and the Holy Spirit at work and being able to work along with them is a huge privilege, and it really makes me feel like I have a window into Jehovah's invisible spirit organization in action, and to join him in that is very special and exciting and has brought me so much joy. Yes, that is very special. Thank you so much, Sister Winkler. Next, we'd like to interview Sister Angela Burris. Sister Burris, could you tell us how Jehovah personally drew to him your Bible student by the name of Eliani? She was going through many family problems, such as family lying to her. Unknowingly, she bought some airline tickets from a company that was going bankrupt. All these things caused her to wonder who can be trusted? One day, she looked up at the sky and she said, Oh God, I can't live like this. Then two sisters came to her door talking about Jehovah. That's Jehovah at work. Sister Burris, could you tell us about some key moments in the study that led to a change? We read to her 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1-5, through 5, which describes how people would act in the last days. She immediately realized Jehovah doesn't like people lying. That thought appealed to her. She accepted a Bible study and attended an assembly. After that assembly, she saw older and younger brothers and sisters uh, cleaning up, and that was something she had never seen. At that point, she expressed her desire to become a part of Jehovah's family. Another time was her meditation from Bible reading. She wondered, why would Jehovah want us to read all the names in First Chronicles? Pausing, she said, I know why. Because he wants us to pay attention to the details. It's important for us. And it was evident that Iliani was aligning her thoughts with Jehovah's thinking. That is beautiful. Well, now, Sister Burris, could you also tell us how you feel about working along with Jehovah in making disciples? This experience with Jehovah's study makes me happy to be used by him in this way. And the sentiments of 3 John 4 come to mind, no greater joy do I have than this. That's very nice, and it's so nice to see that Iliani's a baptized sister and doing so well. Thank you, Sister Burris. We really appreciate that. Yes, these experiences have helped us to see that we can rejoice in Jehovah. So yes, Jehovah is the happy God. And as we've learned in our theme scripture of Psalm 92, verses 4 and 5, we have learned that Jehovah makes us rejoice in his deeds. And the making of disciples is one of the most exciting works that he's accomplishing today. So may all of us cherish our privilege that we have to work along with Jehovah in making disciples. As you do, you can rejoice in Jehovah. Brother Wayne Henderson will now consider the next talk of the symposium, Jehovah Makes Us Rejoice as We Support Fellow Believers. You cannot see them, but without them, you would not be able to stand up straight, nor would you be able to walk. Without them, we would all essentially be nothing more than a lifeless mass of tissue. I'm talking about our bones. Why are we talking about bones? Well, the Christian congregation has often been compared to a body. And while it is true that most references in the scriptures refer to the anointed congregation of God's people, 
By extension, they also apply to all members of the congregations of God's people under the loving care of Christ's brothers. Thus, there exists an interdependence within and among the congregations of God's people. When writing to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul wrote about this interdependence of fellow believers using the analogy of joints and ligaments of the body. But what is it that supports all of this? The bones. In like manner, like the bones support our body, it should be our desire to loyally support one another. As our Father, God, and friend, Jehovah takes the lead in supporting his loyal servants by means of comforting his people in times of trial. For good reason, then, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, call Jehovah the Father of tender mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our trials. We are so grateful for this, but let us not forget the key reason that Jehovah does this, so that we may be able to comfort others in any sort of trial with the comfort that we receive from God. So the idea we have here is that once we receive the comfort or support, we then give the support. It's reciprocal. And the fact that Jehovah does this also reflects loyalty on his part. It is just as the psalmist says, with someone loyal, you will act in loyalty. How we especially need this support in these last days. Therefore, what are some ways that we can offer support to our brothers? How does Jehovah support his servants? Well, Jehovah strengthens us by means of his Holy Spirit to endure a trial. Oftentimes, it's the strength that we get from reading his holy scriptures, which are inspired by his Holy Spirit. Now, while it is that Jehovah is the one providing the support, it can be said that we work along with him when we support our fellow believers. Let's prove this as we turn in our Bibles to the 41st Psalm. Please turn with me to Psalm 41. And at verse 1, notice how this process is described. That's Psalm 41, verse 1. It says, Happy is anyone who shows consideration to the lowly one. Jehovah will rescue him in the day of calamity. Here, the verse mentions this showing of consideration. This showing of consideration is a process of sorts. It involves empathetic fellow feeling that is given on an ongoing basis. And when these acts, when these qualities are expressed toward our brothers and sisters, it moves us to look for ways to support them. This becomes a basis for rejoicing. Let's talk about some ways specifically that we can rejoice as we support others. We'll go back again to our Bibles to a scripture that we've come to enjoy over the years, Acts chapter 20 and verse 35. As we turn to Acts 20, 35, however, let's look at it with some renewed appreciation for this matter of supporting one another. Verse 35 of Acts chapter 20 reads, I have shown you in all things that by working hard in this way, you must assist those who are weak and must keep in mind the words of the Lord Jesus when he himself said, there is more happiness in giving than there is in receiving. Did you note here that it did not say that there was no happiness in receiving, but that there is more happiness in giving. Why? Well, really, it's in keeping with the way we were designed. We were created and we were designed by the greatest giver ever. And thus we find that when we give, this is what gives a greater sense of purpose and, and meaning in life because it is in harmony with the way we were made. When we do this, when we give, we are simply imitating our Father Jehovah. The Apostle Paul, too, likewise experienced this joy as he gave of himself completely in behalf of his brothers. He said there at Philippians chapter 2 that he poured himself out like a drink offering, holding nothing back in behalf of the brotherhood. 
So when we think about this and we think about ways that we can support one another, we can do this emotionally in harmony with the example that Paul set for us. How would this happen? Well, our brothers and sisters may need emotional support when they lose a loved one in death, when they face a serious illness, or when they encounter other trying situations. Like what? Dealing with feelings of isolation during this pandemic, loss of work and the attendant economic challenges, having to work and being fearful for their safety, opposition from family members, unrealized goals, the list goes on. But then besides emotional support, we can support our fellow believers physically by helping them in practical ways. How so? Well, if it is possible or safe, we may be called upon to deliver food or literature, especially to those who may be sick or shut in due to health limitations. What about just picking up the phone and engaging in a, an encouraging conversation? Yes, uh, caring for our brothers and sisters in times of pandemic is really preparation for future tribulations. This is not the only way that we can support one another. Uh, also, spiritually speaking, we need to do this for our brothers and sisters, supporting them as we worship Jehovah together. Therefore, why not make it a goal to see what we can do to contribute to the warm and upbuilding spirit in the congregation? And we can do that at our Christian meetings. For example, have you ever gone to a gathering where everyone was asked, to bring a dish. Don't you enjoy tasting what others have brought? Well, your comments are like that, uh, like that tasty dish that is prepared just the way you like to prepare it. Your encouraging comments are your gift to our fellow worshipers, a gift that contributes to their joy. Additionally, we can invite others to accompany us in the ministry uh, on Bible studies, or join us in family worship. During this time, we can use this opportunity to, to strengthen our resolve and our ability to engage in aspects of the ministry that previously we may have found a little uncomfortable, such as telephone witnessing and letter writing. The joy that we experience through this process is mutual. What about this? What about at an appropriate time taking advantage of the opportunity to share a scriptural thought with a fellow believer, one that is well chosen for their specific circumstance? Or even yet, what about a sincere prayer, a prayer in their behalf, just when they need it the most? Doing this will not only bring you and the recipient closer to God, but closer to one another as you pray together. Now, congregation elders have a special role and a special opportunity to provide spiritual support to fellow believers. At 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, mention is made of their opportunity, their privilege of shepherding the flock of God. And at verse 3 of 1 Peter chapter 5, that flock of God is called God's inheritance. Why? Well, Jehovah does consider anointed Christians but by extension, all of his worshipers an inheritance, his inheritance because he possesses them, having purchased them with the, with the precious blood of his son. And yet there is another special opportunity that elders have to be able to assist those who have uh, maybe slowed down or become inactive in their service to Jehovah. And so as they seek them and find them, then the shepherd has joy or over having found what was lost. And the sheep have joy over having been found. Dear elders, we commend you for your hard work in, in a self-sacrificing way, shepherding these sheep, caring for them. Keep proving to be a real shepherd, spiritually supporting Jehovah's precious sheep. It will add to their joy and yours as well. At this time, we'd like to talk to a couple of publishers who have actually been doing many of the things that we've been talking about. Uh, 
And first, we'd like to speak with Brother Isaac Hutto. Brother Hutto, what is it that you were able to do to help others? Well, in 2018, after Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, I had the opportunity to help out in disaster relief, uh, specifically with rebuilding and repairing houses for two months. And how did this work bring you joy? Well, previously I had worked in construction, uh, but there was a real uh, gratifying difference in disaster relief construction. How so? Well, in disaster relief, it really felt like we were helping rebuild these friends' uh, homes and lives rather than just that physical house they were going to live in. Uh, for me, it was such a joy to see the satisfaction of a family that had been uh, displaced finally get back into a home that was safe and dry. Uh, their hugs of appreciation and, and tears of joy was really like nothing I'd ever experienced before in person. That sounds really special. Were there other ways that you benefited? Yes. Uh, seeing the love of the friends in action was truly something special. Uh, one example that comes to mind is that of a local couple I got to work with that was always so upbeat and smiling, happy to be there. I had no idea, though, that one of the last houses our hub was responsible for in repairing was theirs. Uh, their house had been completely wiped out during the hurricane, and yet they chose to spend the better part of a year working on everybody else's house instead of their own. And for me, getting to see awesome experiences like this, it was such a blessing because these friends put the interest and well-being of others ahead of themselves, and they did so with such a happy and positive attitude. We're glad you had that experience. Thank you very much for sharing that. We're also going to speak to Sister Laurie Jones. And Brother Sister Jones, we'll put the same question to you. What is it that you were able to do to help others? My husband and I had the opportunity to help different ones that were going through some very challenging times, sometimes life-threatening, some that even ended in death. But we were able to be there with them, do what needed to be done through these challenges with Jehovah's help that brought us a joy that we can't even really put words to. So, so how did this work bring you joy? When you're with them and you see them going through these challenges, it's like you're looking through a window and you're seeing their faith, their integrity, their relationship with Jehovah. If we weren't there helping them, we wouldn't get to see this blessing. And that's a joy that, like I said before, you can't put words to. Can you give us a specific example? There's one that really sticks in our minds is when we were with a couple, they, we had to go to the ER middle of the night. The wife had terminal cancer and she was not doing well at all. And we're in the ER room, it's dark, and you see the husband bow his head, say a prayer to Jehovah, then he's looking for a scripture. He leaned over to his wife. You could see him reading it to her. Then you could see her calmness. But to us, to see that intimacy between the husband, the wife, and Jehovah, and then Jehovah's spirit on him, that's priceless. That's a joy that you get when you open your heart to your brothers and sisters. Wow, interesting. Thank you very much for giving that kind of support to the brotherhood. May Jehovah bless you for your efforts. Thank you. Certainly the experiences that we just heard and other things that we discussed here today give us the motivation to continue to loyally support our brothers. It's a joy that we can experience as well as we work along with Jehovah, helping to support our brothers and sisters physically emotionally and spiritually, just like the bones support the body. But remember, these opportunities won't always just come to you. You'll have to look for them. And why do we want to do this? Not only does it bring them joy, but Jehovah in turn makes us rejoice because of it, because we've supported our fellow believers, our friends, our brothers and sisters in the faith. Brother Charles Corbin will now consider the final talk of this symposium. Jehovah makes us rejoice as we endure trials. Have you faced any trials in life recently? No matter how old we are, no matter where we live in the world, we all face trials, yes, problems, hardships, or sufferings in life. For example, many people are victims of crime war, poverty, natural disasters, and really all of us, one way or another, have been affected by this COVID-19 pandemic. Additionally, some of you may be suffering with poor health or devastated by the loss of a loved one. 
According to Matthew chapter 10, verses 22 and 23, Jesus said that his disciples would have additional problems to deal with. They would be hated. They would be persecuted. This very much brings to mind our dear brothers and sisters in Eritrea, Russia, and other countries. Despite it all, Jehovah's people worldwide continue to serve him loyally. So how is it possible to experience joy and peace of mind in the midst of trials? Well, note please what's recorded for us in the Bible at Psalm 37 and verse 1. Please turn with me in your Bible to Psalm 31 and verse 7. Again, at Psalm 31 and verse 7. The psalmist sang, I will rejoice greatly in your loyal love, for you have seen my affliction. You are aware of my deep distress. Isn't it reassuring to know that Jehovah looks down from heaven and he sees our afflictions? He is aware of our deep distresses. Yes, Jehovah knows of all the trials we face in life. And like the psalmist, we know that our God, Jehovah, is a God of loyal love. So he will never, ever abandon us. <laughs> it brings to mind the original song, Never Alone. Add to that, Jehovah makes available many loving provisions to help us to endure trials with joy. And let's focus in on just two of these loving provisions. One, Jehovah's Word, and two, Jehovah's Holy Spirit. Regarding that first provision, Jehovah's Word, it really is a source of comfort and joy in times of distress. To illustrate, let's turn to Psalm 1, and we're going to read verses 1, 2, and 6. Again, we invite you to follow along, if you will, in your Bible as we turn to Psalm 1, and we're going to read verses 1, 2, and 6. We read, Happy is the man who does not walk according to the advice of the wicked, and does not stand on the path of sinners, and does not sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of Jehovah, and he reads his law in undertone day and night. Verse 6 for Jehovah is aware of the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Jehovah is aware. He knows our efforts to live according to his righteous principles in life. Jehovah is also aware that we find delight in reading his word, the Bible, regularly on a daily basis. Jehovah is also aware that we look to his word for the best advice to deal with trials in life. And when we dig into God's word, we can go to the Psalms to find comfort. We can look at the gospel accounts to learn from Jesus and how he dealt with trials in life. What about Bible prophecies? When we see prophecies being fulfilled even down to our day, doesn't it give us courage to remain steadfast in the face of various trials in life? And then throughout the pages of the Bible, we have examples of those like Hannah, Job, and others who endure trials, they maintain their loyalty, and in the end, they had reasons to rejoice. Yes, Jehovah's Word helps us to deal with trials and to do so with joy. The second provision, Jehovah's Holy Spirit, is also a source of joy, joy and strength. For example, let's consider the inspired words of the Apostle Peter. Please turn with me in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 4, and let's look at verses 13 and 14. That's 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Now, when Peter penned these words, he was speaking from experience. He faced opposition, sufferings, and trials when he was on earth. And we pick up the account in verse 13. 
On the contrary, go on rejoicing over the extent to which you are sharers in the sufferings of the Christ, so that you may rejoice and be overjoyed during the revelation of his glory. If you are being reproached for the name of Christ, you are happy, because the Spirit of glory, yes, the Spirit of God, is resting upon you. So what helped Peter to endure trials with joy? We see the latter part of verse 14. The Spirit of God is resting upon you. Yes, Jehovah's Holy Spirit helped Peter to endure. And that same gift of Jehovah's Spirit helps us today to endure trials with joy. In harmony with Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, Holy Spirit produces in us various aspects of the fruit of each other's spirit, such as joy, peace, patience, faith, qualities that can help us to endure trials. At Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, we are encouraged to meet together regularly with our brothers and sisters. So we might ask, well, how do the meetings help us to endure trials with joy? Well, the provisions of one, Jehovah's Word, and two, Jehovah's Holy Spirit, are richly available at our congregation meetings. Within our local congregations, we are blessed to associate with older ones who have remained loyal to Jehovah and loyal to his organization despite various trials in life. At this time, we're going to interview Sister Jeanette Harrop and Brother Woodworth Mills. First, we're going to spend some time with Sister Harrop. Now, Sister Harrop has been baptized for some 67 years, and she's been in a full-time service for more than 52 years. Sister Harrop, what are some of the trials you have faced? Living in Brooklyn, New York during September 11, 2001 was a challenging time. Being so close to such a tragedy was stressful for so many of us. A few years later, my husband became very ill. Supporting him included going on several very long trips for treatments. In October 2017, my dear husband died. This happened just after losing both parents and my only sibling, all within eight months. Oh my, that's quite a bit there, our sister. So what have you done to draw close to Jehovah? Many long, deep prayers, lingering in prayer to Jehovah, continuing the meetings, field service, and personal study as much as I can. Excellent. And finally, how has Jehovah helped you to endure with joy? Specific answers to specific prayers in harmony with His will, the wonderful loving brotherhood, and the continuing supply of rich spiritual food. Reflecting on the words of Jeremiah 29, verses 11 and 12, has helped me to endure as well. It says, For I well know the thoughts that I am thinking toward you, declares Jehovah, thoughts of peace and not of calamity, to give you a future and a hope. And you will call me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Thank you, Sister Harrop. Next, we're going to speak with Brother Woodworth Mills. Now, Brother Mills has been baptized for 81 years, and he's been in a full-time service for some 67 years. Brother Mills, what are some of the trials you have faced in life? Probably my most severe trial was the loss of my dear wife, Oris, a few years ago. I frequently had malaria. One time it was life-threatening. And then together we went through a dreadful civil war. But in all of that, she remained happy, and so did I. Jehovah made us rejoice together for 68 wonderful years. You've been through a lot, our brother. So what have you done to draw close to Jehovah? Three things mainly. 
prayed for endurance, for direction, for help. And then secondly, trusted in Jehovah with all my heart. My heart told me that uh, Jehovah is going to come through, and that he did. And so I just kept busy, that's the third thing, busy having a full day of activity in work that I enjoy doing. Excellent. And finally, how has Jehovah helped you to endure with joy? Well, Jehovah helped me to see challenges as opportunities to refine my Christian personality. I still rejoice in all that I have to do. The joy of Jehovah continues to be my stronghold, and so I'm happy to have plenty of to do in the work of the Lord. Thank you, Brother Mills. And don't we value the sterling examples of our older ones who remain loyal to Jehovah and his organization despite various trials in life. Brothers, sisters, and visitors, this symposium has confirmed Jehovah's works are really a cause for great rejoicing. And Jehovah will always loyally support us because Jehovah loves us. And that brings us to review question number five in our program. Please, we invite you to turn to your program. Review question number five, the question, How does Jehovah make us rejoice? The answer, Psalm 92, verses 4 and 5. Jehovah makes us rejoice by allowing us to work along with him in making disciples and supporting our fellow worshipers and by strengthening us to endure trials. Whatever trial you may be enduring, you can be certain of Jehovah's unfailing support. As noted there in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 11, we worship the happy God. Hence, in line with the theme of this circuit assembly program, we have every reason to rejoice in Jehovah. And just think, in the very near future, Jehovah will perform all inspiring acts of salvation that will give all of us greater cause for rejoicing, yes, rejoicing forever. Thank you, brothers. How reassuring to know that we always have Jehovah's support. We now invite you to stand and sing song number two entitled, Jehovah is Your Name. After the song, there will be an announcement, and if you wish, you may remain standing. Again, that's song number two.
Jehovah's arrangement for feeding us spiritually includes the preparation and distribution of programs such as this one. Those who wish to assist with the expenses for these provisions may donate online at donate.jw.org. You may be seated. We have now come to the concluding talk of this assembly. All day we have seen that true joy comes from knowing Jehovah God. How can we keep Jehovah at the center of our thoughts? Please give your attention to Brother David Schaefer as he concludes our assembly with the talk, Keep Jehovah Before You Constantly. Have you had to learn new methods of communicating these past few months? Teleconferencing, group chats, as well as texting and writing letters and emails are all useful, and we're grateful that we can still keep in touch with friends, relatives, workmates, and we'll keep using these methods as long as necessary. But it's just not the same as being together, is it? However, there is one relationship that has not changed. It's remained constant. In fact, it may even be stronger now than ever before. It's certainly more important now than ever. It's the most precious relationship we have, keeping Jehovah before us constantly. It brings joy both now and forever. In this discussion, we're going to center on how to keep Jehovah in our thoughts and actions, not just at specific times, such as when we go to meetings or say prayers, but as we go about our activities each day. Now first though, how do we know that there's a link between joy and centering our attention on Jehovah constantly? Turn with me, please, to the 16th Psalm, where we find the key scripture for this talk, Psalm 16. You see from the superscription that this psalm was written by David. Now notice how he describes his feelings and why he has them. Psalm 16, beginning in verse 8. I keep Jehovah before me constantly. Because he is at my right hand, I will never be shaken. Now, what do you suppose he means? Jehovah is at my right hand. Well, David fought the battles for Jehovah. And usually warriors carried a sword in their right hand and a shield in their left. And, and that meant that uh, their right hand was in need of extra defenses that could only be provided by someone else. David was convinced that as he kept Jehovah's will foremost in his thoughts and actions, Jehovah would protect him. And the result, well, notice verse 9. So, the result, so my heart rejoices and my whole being is joyful and I reside in security. My whole being is joyful, he said. Why did David feel that way? Because of his constant focus on and confidence in Jehovah. Well, now, you might recall that not everything in Psalm 16 pertains to David himself. Look, for instance, at verse 10. For you will not leave me in the grave... You will not allow your loyal one to see the pit. And remember that at Pentecost 33 CE, the Apostle Peter applied all of these words, Psalm 16, 8 through 11, to none other than our Lord Jesus Christ, showing that whereas David died and was buried, Jesus was not forsaken in the grave because Jehovah resurrected him. The point for us, dear friends, is this. As foreshadowed in the 16th Psalm, Jesus was keen to please his Father, and that focus brought Jesus abundant joy and eternal happiness, as Psalm 1611 also mentions. And we too can find joy if we imitate Jesus' example. Now especially, living as we are in this age of distraction and change, how do we keep Jehovah in our thoughts 
constantly as we go about our daily activities. We want to consider four ways today that we can do that. First, by paying attention to Jehovah's creation. Second, by keeping our minds fixed on God's inspired word. Third, by keeping close to Jehovah in prayer. And fourth, by choosing friends who also keep Jehovah before themselves constantly. We're going to discuss how Jesus did that, how we can do that, and how all of that relates to joy. Let's begin at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Please turn there. As we contemplate our first way to keep Jehovah in mind, namely by paying attention to his creation. Now, how does creation help us to focus on Jehovah? It's not automatic. Romans 1.20 shows us the process. Notice, for his invisible qualities are clearly seen from the world's creation onward because they are perceived by the things made, even his eternal power and godship, so that they are inexcusable. Yes, the things made reveal Jehovah's qualities, but we have to pay attention in order to perceive the qualities, to see beyond the creation to the creator. For instance, Jehovah's wisdom can be seen in the animal creation. What is your favorite bird to watch in flight? Is it a, a row of pelicans flying in a straight line low, just a few feet above the surf? Or the amazing aerial maneuvers of swallows? Or how about the albatross? With its 11-foot wingspan, it can glide for years without landing. Seriously. In their lifetime, they can fly between two and three million miles. That's like making five trips to the moon and back. What's the fastest bird? That depends on what you're measuring. The peregrine falcon has been clocked at 217 miles per hour. On the other hand, the diving hummingbird can reach speeds of almost 400 body lengths per second. Uh, but this means that when pulling up at the end of its dive, the bird is subject to a force ten times that of gravity. A pilot, a human pilot, would quickly go unconscious under the same circumstances. Or much could be said about birds' amazing ability to communicate. Each of the thousands of species of birds has its own unique voice and vocabulary. The chickadee can make 50 distinct sounds that communicate important phrases like, I'm hungry, or I'm afraid of that hawk. The chickadee is named after its danger call. Maybe you've heard one when you're out for a walk. Chickadee, dee, 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 dee. The more dees, the greater the danger it senses. And researchers have discovered that the nuthatch will actually eavesdrop on chickadee warning calls and retweet them to their neighbors. A National Geographic recently reported on new research that suggests that the nuthatch will repeat only the general alarm at first. They won't vocalize the more specific information until, the pred until they can uh, verify the truth about the predator. <laughs> Elihu said, as recorded at Job 35.11, that Jehovah makes us wiser than the flying creatures of the heavens. Well, hopefully we are wiser when it comes to repeating unsubstantiated information. But do you make the effort to perceive Jehovah's wisdom in the animal creation? Or consider Jehovah's power? Isaiah chapter 40, verse 26, shows how the stars testify to Jehovah's vast dynamic energy and his awe-inspiring power. Now, what's your favorite star? Our sun is an average-sized star. How much energy does it radiate? Imagine how intense a fire would have to be if you could stand 10 miles away from it and still feel its heat. Well, our sun is 93 million miles away, and yet it can blister our skin. And only a billionth of its energy actually reaches our Earth. And yet that's enough to sustain life on our planet. A billionth of the energy of just one star. 
And yet, when you look up at night, you're seeing thousands of stars, each effusing vast amounts of energy. And there are billions upon billions more that we can't see with the unaided eye. Wisdom and power. How about Jehovah's justice? Can you think of a creation that reveals Jehovah's justice? Think about your immune system. Yes, we've been thinking a lot about our immune systems lately. The journal Scientific American said, quote, from before birth until death, the immune system is in a state of constant alert. A diverse array of molecules and cells protects us against parasites and pathogens. Without those defenses, humans could not survive, end of the quote. Well, what do you perceive from this about our creator who provides such a remarkable immune system for rich and poor alike. Clearly, Jehovah is wise and just and fair. But how about his dominant quality of love? You can perceive it in everything Jehovah has made, but let's give attention to just one aspect of creation that highlights Jehovah's love, a mother's tender care. Who originated the family? Who invented the mother? Who crafted the human endocrine system in such a way that during birth, mothers experience elevated levels of the hormone oxytocin, uh, which is believed to play a role in the urge to act in a loving and self-sacrificing way? Who made people that way? Genesis 127 says that we were created in God's image. So a mother's love teaches us about Jehovah's great love. What kind of a personality, what kind of mind did it take not only to bring all of these things into existence, but to sustain them for millenniums? As Romans 1.20 says, we have evidence not only of Jehovah's invisible qualities and his eternal power, but his Godship. Jehovah is truly God. He alone is worthy of our worship perceive the connection between the things made and the creator. Now, do you recall how Jesus set an example in this? Uh, where did Jesus choose to give his sermon on the mount? On the mount. On a mountain near Capernaum that sloped down toward the Sea of Galilee. And what did he talk about? Among other things, creation, lilies of the field, straw, fruit trees, birds of the heavens, fish, snakes, moths, pigs, dogs, sheep, and wolves, salt of the earth, stones, sun, rain, wind, and sand. Jesus used the creation to teach about the creator. If this is how God clothes the vegetation of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much rather clothe you? If this is how Jehovah takes care of birds, will he not much rather feed you? If this is how Jehovah provides sun and rain, impartially, both to wicked people and to good, can we not imitate this quality of his? Well, can we not imitate Jesus in this kind of meditation and teaching. Why not take your family study outside once in a while? Plan a trip to the backyard. Teach lessons from what surrounds you. This was actually recommended in our Kingdom Ministry of January 2011. Page 6 contained a box entitled, Some Ideas for Family Worship Evening, with 24 suggestions. But now, in practical terms, how would you do that? Well, you could compare a fruit tree to a local factory. To highlight Jehovah's wisdom, you could point out that the fruit tree creates no air pollution. To the contrary, it cleans the air. And to highlight Jehovah's hospitality, you could point out that Jehovah makes abundant fruit, each containing a seed so that future generations can enjoy it. And by the way, does Jehovah even eat fruit? No, he has made all of these things for our benefit and pleasure. By contrast, a local factory emits pollution and noise and then requires payment for its products. How superior Jehovah's wisdom and hospitality are. Jehovah generously provides so many things for our enjoyment. Meditating on his qualities as revealed in creation helps us 
and our families draw closer to him. And speaking of family study, uh, turn please to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And let's talk about that second way that we keep Jehovah before us constantly. Jehovah speaks to us through his inspired word, the Bible. The question is, what do we do with these words once we read them? Notice what it says here in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. It says, these words that I am commanding you today must be on your heart, and you must inculcate them in your sons and speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk on the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as a reminder on your hand, and they must be like a headband on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, while those words apply to training children, they apply to everyone who wants to keep Jehovah in mind constantly. We need to know Jehovah's commands by heart. More importantly, we want to know the person. Yes, he says, avoid this, do that. But why? Why? requires meditation. Meditate on Jehovah's Word frequently throughout the day, not just during periods of personal study. Deuteronomy 6.8 says, tie these inspired words on your hand. Hands represent actions. So if Jehovah's law is tied to our hands, it means that we are obedient to Jehovah, doing work that he approves because we love him. And Jehovah's law was also to be like a, a headband on their forehead. A reminder tied to your hand is something that you always see, but a headband on your forehead is something others always see. They can't miss it. In like manner, Jehovah's law should constitute our identity visible to all at all times, whether we're at home, on the road, or near the city gates where elders handled legal cases. And as it says at the beginning of Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 6, before we can motivate others, Jehovah's word must be on our heart. So reflect on how Jehovah's word can guide you. In everyday situations, Jesus did that. Let's re-examine the notable account at Matthew chapter 4. Remember what Jesus did when he was tempted by the devil. He immediately thought of scriptures that applied to his situation. When the devil tempted Jesus to turn stones into loaves of bread, Jesus refused to use his power to satisfy personal desires. But why? He said, as recorded at Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, man must live... First, he said, it is written, man must live not on bread alone, but on every word that comes from Jehovah's mouth, quoting Deuteronomy 8.3. Now, we often use that as an example of how we too should use scriptures when making decisions or resisting temptations. But drill deeper. Scriptures are more than just excerpts from a law book. They teach us about Jehovah's personality. Look for the action, and you'll learn about the person. So let's take this scripture that Jesus quoted as an example, Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. What was the context, the significance of those words? Jehovah's provision of the manna. Manna, making a provision for manna, was an action, something Jehovah did. What does the action teach you about the person? Well, what gave rise to the manna provision? Complaint. The Israelites were hungry. They were at wit's end. They started remembering the food they enjoyed in Egypt, and they started complaining against Moses and Aaron. So what did Jehovah do? He gave them not just food, but obedient 
food, food that taught lessons. This was food that always did what Jehovah said it would do. So they had to pick it up according to Jehovah's instructions. If they took more than they could eat in a day, it bred worms and stank. Uh, but on the sixth day, that was different. If they didn't collect twice as much on the sixth day, then they went hungry on the seventh day. On the other hand, the manna stored in a jar inside of the Ark of the Covenant at Jehovah's command, remained for decades without breeding worms. It was by this remarkable food that Jehovah taught the people that the situation that they were in was not about bread. It was about confidence in the giver of life and trust in his promises. That is the power behind the principle. Jesus didn't need to worry about food. His trust was in his Father, whose love is constant, whose word is certain. So it wasn't just, here's an excerpt from a law book, but implicit faith in a loving Father who cannot lie. All of that wrapped up in Deuteronomy 8.3. But the devil used that confidence against Jesus. You want to Play, quote that scripture. Here's one, Psalm 91, 11 and 12. So throw yourself down off this high wall and let's see the angel come to your rescue. But again, Jesus used Deuteronomy 6, 16, as stated at Matthew chapter 4 and verse 7. Again, it is written, you must not put Jehovah your God to the test. Then the devil offered him all the kingdoms of the world and their power, and Jesus flatly refused, but not without a Bible principle. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, Go away, Satan, for it is written, It is Jehovah your God you must worship, and it is to him alone you must render sacred service. Again, drawing from Deuteronomy, possibly combining thoughts from three different texts. Jesus kept Jehovah in mind constantly, and on that account, he resisted the tempter throughout his life, and his heart was cheerful, and he resided in hope. Well, we can do that too, and that's the point. As we go about our daily activity, reflect on how Jehovah's word can guide us. Here we are, going through a pandemic. Ask yourself, why am I stuck here during this lockdown when others seem to be out there enjoying life? Why do I have to wear a mask when I'm around people? What's the Bible principle? 1 Corinthians 10, 24, let each one keep seeking not his own advantage, but that of the other person. Why am I writing all these letters and making phone calls to strangers? There may be a number of texts that come to your mind. Romans 10, 14, how will they hear? without someone to preach. Mark 13, 10, in all the nations, the good news has to be preached. Or the two greatest commandments, love Jehovah your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. But go deeper. Where is the action of Jehovah in all of these texts? What does it teach you about Jehovah's personality? Keep Jehovah in front of you constantly. Why am I avoiding unwholesome entertainment? The principles. Psalm 11, 5. Jehovah hates anyone loving violence. Ephesians 5, 3. Let uncleanness and greediness not even be mentioned among you, just as it befits holy people. Now they're pressuring me at work to join in protest. They say silence is consent. That seems like a sound principle. Of course, I don't consent to cruelty. So what's my response? Isaiah 11, 3 and 4, I support a government that's completely just and fair, one that can actually ensure justice for all. For every course in life, a Bible principle. Behind the principle is an action. In the action, we see the personality of Jehovah. Look for it. Living by these principles is our identity. God's law is tied as a reminder on our hand and worn as a headband on our forehead. Jesus did that. We can do that. Now, this kind of careful study of Jehovah's word will also help us with our third way of keeping Jehovah before us constantly, and that is keeping 
close to Jehovah in prayer. Now turn with me, please, to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Prayer is Jehovah's provision for us to speak to him. Are you convinced that Jehovah is the hearer of prayer, as he's called at Psalm 65, 2? Some people think that prayer is only of psychological benefit. They claim that if you think your prayer is answered, it's just because you put your thoughts into words, identified your problem, and set your mind on finding a solution. But is that all there is to it? How did Jesus feel about prayer? For thousands of years before he came to the earth, Jesus watched firsthand as his father answered countless prayers. And then here he was on earth using that very same means of communication. Would he have done so if he thought Jehovah wasn't really listening? Would he have taught his disciples how to pray if he thought it was just a mental trick? Jesus knew that prayer is real. He said, as recorded at John 11, 41 and 42, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. True, I knew that you always hear me. You always hear me. We too have confidence that Jehovah is the hearer of prayer and the answerer of prayer. And when we're specific in our prayers, we become more keenly aware of those answers, even if they may be subtle. The more you express your innermost concerns to Jehovah, the closer he will draw to you. Now notice the exhortation we find here in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Do not be anxious over anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, along with thanksgiving, let your petitions be made known to God. Now notice that it first says, in everything. Well, what does that include? It includes anything that affects our relationship with Jehovah or our life as one of his servants. So a change of employment affects our life as Jehovah's servants, our ability to care for our families, spiritual and physical needs. Moving to another city or country would obviously have an impact on your life as one of Jehovah's servants. It could impact the lives of many others, both in the place you leave and the place you go. It could be a positive step, but it could also have significant dangers. But what about your approach to an assignment in the congregation or in the organization or your relationships with others? How will you carry out your ministry? Perhaps you need help in your marriage, help raising your children or adapting to the death of the mate or the unfaithfulness of a mate. Now we're facing challenges related to the virus, quarantine, sheltering in place, isolation, integrating back into society. And of course, we're concerned about all of these things, not just for ourselves, but for others who may be facing these same challenges and yet worse ones. For instance, persecution, imprisonment, ban, natural disasters. All of these things have a direct bearing on our relationship with Jehovah. And let's not forget everything mentioned in the Bible. Is there something in the Bible that you wish you understood better? Make it a matter of prayer. Proverbs 2, 3 through 5 says, Call out for understanding, and you will find the knowledge of God. So the list of things that we can pray about is endless. Thus, Philippians 4, 6 says, Everything. Next, Paul mentions three forms of prayer. Supplication, thanksgiving, and petition. Supplication suggests a heartfelt, earnest entreaty, begging Jehovah for help. What might be an example of that? A turn, please, to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Jesus, of course, is our primary example of one who kept Jehovah before him constantly in prayer. Notice what it says here at Hebrews 5, 7 about supplication. It says, during his life on earth, Christ offered up supplications, plural, and also petitions with strong outcries and tears to the one who was able to save him out of death. And he was favorably heard for his godly fear. Supplications, plural. Jesus implored Jehovah fervently, repeatedly in the Garden of Gethsemane. And this kind of prayer is 
prayer with intense feeling. Uh, life is at stake or the lives of others. Even the topics addressed in the model prayer can be matters for our intense supplication. When we think about what's happening on this earth, surely we should pray with intensity that Jehovah's name be sanctified and that his kingdom rid this earth of Satan's rule. Now, if Jesus had to supplicate repeatedly with strong outcries and tears, how much more so do we? Paul next mentions along with thanksgiving. The list of things that we can thank Jehovah for is endless. We can thank him for the many things that delight our hearts each day, not just the abundant food and clean water, but the creative wonder, the variety in plants and animals. It's hard to imagine a color in which Jehovah has not provided a bird. Well, we can thank him for all of these things, and yet even in difficult times, we should always thank Jehovah. Acts chapter 16, verses 22 through 25, describes how Paul and Silas were attacked by a mob, arrested, beaten with rods, thrown into prison, and fastened with their feet in the stocks. And yet, what were they doing in the middle of the night? Singing. Singing. Praying and praising God with song, it says. Well, we have many examples today of people undergoing extreme pressure, and yet they're grateful. And maybe you noticed that piece on JW.org about the 18 disaster relief committees in Brazil assisting our brothers affected by the economic challenges resulting from the coronavirus. And that includes our brothers and sisters living deep in the isolated Amazon River region. Now, Sister Mari Nelma, who lives in the Lago do Castanjo region, said that after receiving her food supplies, our need here was great, as we had no way to buy food. My six-year-old son saw me unpacking and arranging the provisions, and I took the opportunity to explain that Jehovah used the brothers to help us. Then my little boy said, Mom, could we say a prayer to thank Jehovah Gratitude. Gratitude helps us keep Jehovah first. And next, Philippians 4, 6 concludes with the words, let your petitions be made known to God. These are requests. We can freely ask Jehovah for anything in harmony with his will. Anything. Petitions are important of course. But notice that in this scripture, they're mentioned last. Even in the Lord's Prayer, our personal needs are mentioned last. And this is also borne out in the prayer of the Levites recorded at Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 5 through 38. So this is a lengthy prayer, and we can learn many things from this prayer. You remember, remember this uh, summer we enjoyed the Nehemiah drama at our regional convention televised on JW Broadcasting, and perhaps you remember the beautiful scene at the very beginning of part two where the Levites and the people were gathered for instruction in Jehovah's law and to confess their sins. These were the events of Nehemiah chapter eight. Now the events of chapter nine are not depicted in the drama, but they happened on the exact same occasion. Now, a great way to enjoy this chapter is to play it from the audio Bible. You can do that in JW Library just by tapping the little headphone icon. The recording begins with a characterization of Nehemiah's voice, but then the chapter continues with eight different voices offering this beautiful prayer in turns as a sort of symposium. In this prayer, the Levites recount the nation's history with particular focus on the good hand of Jehovah. Then they confess the nation's lack of appreciation for how Jehovah led them. Only down toward the end of that prayer, in verse 32, do we find one brief expression that we could classify as a request or a petition. But what can we learn from all of this? that there is a clear connection between meditating on Jehovah's inspired word and offering meaningful prayers. Use supplication, thanksgiving, petition 
to keep Jehovah in mind at all times and concerning everything. But now let's talk about our fourth point, And that is choosing friends who keep Jehovah before themselves constantly. We're forced to live in Satan's world, which ignores Jehovah. Uh, Nevertheless, we can find friends who keep Jehovah in mind at all times. Back in the 16th Psalm, uh, notice what David said about his associates. You can use your history button in JW Library. Just tap and hold your little Bible icon. Uh, We're looking for Psalm 16.3. Psalm 16, 3, and the holy ones in the earth, the majestic ones, bring me great delight. David knew the secret of finding true friends. He found great delight in associating with holy ones, those who were morally clean and upright. Uh, You too can find many good friends among those who fear Jehovah and obey him and put him first in their lives. Can you recall the name of a majestic one? who was a dear friend of David? How about Jonathan, son of King Saul? He was about 30 years older than David, and there's a good lesson for us in that. We don't need to restrict our circle of friends to uh, our our peers alone. Uh, David and Saul respected, or rather David and Jonathan, respected one another deeply because each observed how the other trusted in Jehovah when they were fighting against his enemies. That was the basis for one of the most beautiful friendships recorded in Scripture. 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 16 shows that when David was in danger, Jonathan helped him find strength in Jehovah. He even risked his life. For David, and David was a loyal friend too. He promised to take care of Jonathan's family, and he kept that promise even after Jonathan died. At the same time, we need to avoid close friendship with those who allow themselves to be influenced by this wicked, wicked world. Uh, David wrote, as recorded at Psalm 139, verses 21 and 22, Do I not hate those who hate you, O Jehovah? and loathe those who revolt against you. I have nothing but hatred for them. They have become real enemies to me. And we feel that way too. Why? Because our friendship with Jehovah is the most precious relationship we have, the most precious thing we have. It's more valuable than life itself. So we avoid being close friends with anyone who could weaken our faith and damage that relationship. Jesus, too, chose friends who put Jehovah first. He spent a whole night in prayer deliberating over who would be his closest associates, a decision that had everlasting ramifications. Now, these weren't perfect men. Later, Jesus dismissed Judas He also had to correct the 11 others who sometimes gave in to bad traits. But these were loyal men, men who loved Jehovah. Like David, like Jesus, we too find great delight in loving those who love Jehovah and who show their faith in him. How do you feel when you learn about people in your own congregation who took a stand for Jehovah in school or at work? Or maybe you recall working with them out in the ministry and hearing how they expressed their faith or handled a particularly challenging door and yet really honored Jehovah in the process. Doesn't it just draw you closer to that person and make you proud to have him or her as your friend? Maybe you're thinking to yourself, it was sure a lot easier to make new friends before all of this physical distancing mandate. True. Uh, But there are things that we can do to start and maintain friendships. Uh, And remember that what we're talking about here is keeping Jehovah before us constantly. So what we're looking for is how Jehovah is at work in the lives of his friends. And when we have that focus, we listen to our friends carefully, uh, listening for how Jehovah is blessing them. It may even be that by pointing out these facts to your friends, you help them to see things about their own relationship that they may have taken for granted or didn't fully recognize. 
And just as we can listen carefully to people that we can see, so we can do with people that we only read about in our magazines or uh, see interviewed on JW Broadcasting. That is a great way to get to know our global brotherhood. Pay attention to how Jehovah is strengthening his friends and protecting their relationship with him. Now, if you want to speed that process up a little bit, you can go to your Watchtower Library search field and type these words, Jehovah helped me. Jehovah helped me, or Jehovah helped us. And then select sentence scope. By adding a personal pronoun like me or us, you can narrow your search down to personal experiences. Uh, one article that such a search would bring up is, Jehovah helped me meet life's challenges, the story of Brother Dale Irwin in the Watchtower of October 1st, 2006, pages 11 through 15. Young Australian brother starts pioneering, gets accepted to Bethel, marries, and then enters the circuit work. But by the time he's 47 years old, he finds himself the father of eight the last four being quadruplets. Fascinating turns of events. Even the newspapers reported on it. But the real story is, how did Jehovah help this family? Why was this article published in the Watchtower announcing Jehovah's kingdom? Because it gives evidence of what Jehovah is doing in modern times, in the life of his friends. Look for that. Look for it every time you meet one of your brother's or sisters, either in person, in a breakout room, in an article, or on a broadcast. It's easy to get a little downhearted while we're sheltering in place, but then we watched the 2020 Governing Body Report number 5, which included the interviews of our two sisters in Russia, Tatyana and Olga, who had their homes invaded and then spent eight months behind bars, 245 days for their faith. It gave us perspective, didn't it? And it wasn't just a matter of, oh, you think you have it bad, well, just listen to this. No, it was testimony to how they sensed the good hand of Jehovah helped them deal with the trials that they were experiencing. That is priceless. Recall that Tatiana Shamsheva said that Jehovah is very sensitive to our needs. And at times like that, he draws close to us in a unique way. Now turn with me, please, to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. What would you say, dear friends? How can we constantly keep before us something that we cannot see? The answer is by looking more deeply at the things we can see things Jehovah created, the fulfilled promise of God, answers to our prayers, and people who are spiritually strong because of what Jehovah has done for them. Be on the lookout for that, because it will help us to do what we are admonished to do here in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2. Keep your minds fixed fixed on the things above, not on the things on the earth. Satan wants us to think about the things on the earth, and he has filled the earth with false reasonings, worldly philosophies, materialistic attitudes, and frankly, sometimes those things could appeal to our imperfect fleshly inclinations. Of course, it's not that we train ourselves to hate all comfort, pleasure, and joy, as we've learned at this very assembly. Jehovah wants us to rejoice he even tells us that rejoicing is at times accompanied by food and drink and that there are times to laugh and dance. But without Jehovah's Spirit operating in our lives, we might give in to what Paul refers to here as the things on the earth, excesses that appeal to the flesh. How do we win the battle? By keeping our minds on the things above, Jehovah, his Son, his Holy Spirit, the angels, the full realization of our hope, things 
unseen. For spirit-anointed ones, this means keeping their minds on their heavenly hope. For all of us, it means putting Jehovah and the kingdom first. Keeping Jehovah before us constantly will help us safeguard against Satan's attacks. And what will help us keep Jehovah before us constantly? That, dear friends, is our review question. Let's remind ourselves of the four key texts that we considered today. First, Romans 1.20, Jehovah's invisible qualities are clearly seen by the things made. So we keep Jehovah before us by paying attention to what he has made. Second, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9, Jehovah's words must be on our heart, a reference to constant meditation on Jehovah's inspired word, the Bible. Third, uh, uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, in everything, by prayer and supplication, along with thanksgiving, let your petitions be made known to God. Yes, keeping close to Jehovah in prayer. And finally, our fourth point, Psalm 16, 3, Jehovah's holy ones bring me great delight. We choose friends who keep Jehovah before themselves constantly. Remember Psalm 16, written by David, but with an eye on the coming Messiah. Jesus kept Jehovah in mind constantly, and that brought Jesus abundant joy, joy that enabled him to endure a torture stake, despising shame, and for that, Jehovah rewarded him. This is our model. In this world of distraction, confusion, persecution, and revolution where the rules and responses shift daily, keep Jehovah before you constantly. Keep pure worship at the very center of your life and you will rejoice in Jehovah both now and forever. Thank you, Brother Schaefer, for that motivating talk helping us to focus on Jehovah and kingdom interests at all times. We certainly thank you and all the program participants today. Now we will conclude this upbuilding assembly by standing and singing song number seven entitled, Jehovah Our Strength. After the song, you may have your concluding prayer at your individual locations. That's song number seven. <laughs> 